sugar in my hand Down the soda shotgun can Sprinkles going on my band You can see it where you stand Robbing for those sweets and brands Hostess, Twinkie, Zinger, friends Look in my eyes, I don't give a damn Y-O-G-I-B-A-R-Z I'm just hungry, hunting for treats Want to know what's next to we So we gotta go get crispy cream Then a glide over across the street It must be a dream Cause I be seeing big ol' Bubsy Jumping, dunking, covered in some ice cream Gotta get that recipe, flour, butter, salt, and sugar is the recipe. Now I'm the bigger OG, selling what you see. I've been baking, waiting for a feast. Twisting donuts, Spanish donut, baking donuts, selling donuts, getting donuts, raining donuts, falling donuts, munching donuts, filling donuts, singers, itching, ho ho, craving, watch me baking, chocolate donut, maple syrup, glazing donut, pumpkin donut, dunkin' donut, bars of donuts, sprinkle donuts, football donuts, hazel donut, candy donut, Texas donut, Philly donut, jelly donut, crispy donut, powder donut, chocolate donut. Okay, Jim Jipsu, everyone. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kaylee So, and somewhere there on your screen is Prach Lee. We are filmmakers and the co founders of Cambodia Town Film Festival, and also your host for today's panel. Jim uh, Jipsu, everyone. Um, happy Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and welcome to the first ever Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival viral showcase. A virtual showcase presented by Visual Communications. Uh, from celebrating our histories and cultures to mobilizing in our communities to be socially and politically active, we present a um, virtual showcase to keep us all connected. This showcase is brought to you by our partners at Comcast, NBC Universal, Sony Pictures Entertainment, Nielsen, HBO and Warner Media, and National Geographic. For more information, please visit vcmedia.org. And welcome you all to today's program, Cambodia Town Film Festival present Rise and Do. All right, uh, let's meet our guests. Uh, first, if you could wave, is Alice Gu, who is the producer and director of this new documentary we're gonna be talking about today, The Donut King. She is a Los Angeles native who began her career as a director of photography working with renowned directors such as Werner Herzog, Stacey Peralta, and Rory Kennedy, among others. Her commercial clients for print and live action includes Beats by Dre, ESPN, Apple, PETA, and more. She was the director of photography for the film Take Every Wave, The Life of Laird Hamilton, 
which made its premiere at the Sundance Film Festival in 2017. The Donut King is Alice's first directorial debut. Congratulations, <laughs> Alice. And I would like to introduce Mr. Donut King himself, Mr. Ted Nua. The Fu, to dip so. And uh, Mr. Mr. Nua is a Cambodian American entrepreneur and a formerly owner of a chain of um, donut shops in California. He was nicknamed the Donut King in 1975. Um, Mr. Nua fled the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia and with his wife and three children to Southern California and started to work at a donut business. By the end of mid 1980s, Ted uh, um, amassed millions of dollars through his uh, expanding donut shop empire, reported at 62 locations, 62 locations throughout California. So every corner blocks that you guys go to in Long Beach and in California <laughs> is probably owned by this man here himself. So I am proud, I am happy that he's joining us today. And um, he is currently resides in Phnom Penh, uh, Cambodia. Not Phnom Penh, not little Phnom Penh, Cambodia town here, but Phnom Penh, Cambodia. And he is uh, currently working in real estate. So let's get started. And remember, if you have any questions, you can ask us through the feed. Okay, how, how are you two doing, first of all? Uh, fine, doing very fine in Phnom Penh. There's a little rain, okay. but, but, but it makes a, make a fresher weather. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Um, so... I was just thinking while watching this documentary, um, I grew up in the East Coast and um, I didn't know a single Khmer person who like ate a lot of donuts or even, you know, like owned a donut shop. So I was really surprised uh, to move to the, to the West Coast and that 95% of the donut shops here are owned by Cambodians. It just like blew my mind. And, and this was in my late twenties. So um, I just would like to know Alice, um, could you talk about the genesis of this documentary and how you came to meet and connect with Ted? And I'm just there. Let's start there. Yeah, uh, it, it's a funny story. Uh, I was, you know, I'm a mother to a three-year-old, so this is a couple of years ago. I had a new baby, and we had hired a new nanny who worked with us, and you know, I live on the west side of Los Angeles where there are, you know, plenty of high-end bakeries. And my husband brought home these, basically these high-end donuts. I called them bougie donuts. <laughs> and we brought them home and we offered them to our nanny who said, oh, no, thank you. Uh, I only eat Cambodian donuts. <laughs> like, what? I'm like, these are, these are from Huckleberry. Like, these are like $5 donuts. Like, <laughs> she's like, no, 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 I'm good. I only eat Cambodian donuts. And we're wondering what's a Cambodian donut. And she goes on again, oh, Alice, I you know, she'd been working with us for like four days. And she said, oh, I found a Cambodian donut shop around here. And I said, what it is a Cambodian donut? But I was super busy. And she said, oh, you know, and I was like, I'm a foodie. I don't know what a Cambodian donut is. I've also lived here for seven years. You don't drive. And you, like within four days, you found a Cambodian donut shop. And I'm thinking, what is a Cambodian donut? And one day she brought us Cambodian donuts, my husband and I, and they came in this wax paper bag and they're fluffy and we, we took a bite and it was delicious. And, but at the same time, we, we looked at her and we said, okay, these are really delicious, but this is a glazed donut, right? <laughs> and she, and she says, no, but it's a Cambodian donut. And we're like, what makes it Cambodian? This just tastes like a donut. Which is it's a Cambodian donut because Cambodian people make them. And then my husband starts grilling her and I'm like, but if a Cambodian person makes an American donut, it's still an American donut, right? She says, no, it's a Cambodian donut. So we have this conversation <laughs> and my husband is, is grilling her and she's like, no, it's real. Like Cambodian, their donuts, they're, they're fluffier, they're less sweet, they're fresher, they're better. And I look it up, you know, challenging her and and I lost the challenge. All these articles came up about Ted Noy and why are donut boxes pink and the Donut King and the rise and fall and then I, LA Times eat like all these different articles and I read every single one and was completely fascinated. And I just knew somebody had to make a film about this story. And I paused for a second and realized 
that person should be me. How long ago was that? This was almost exactly two years ago. Oh, wow. Very cool. No, I, I was watching the scene um, with uh, the film clips of people, the actors holding the pink donut. Um, and I just said, wow, like you, you never, like these things are always in your head, but you don't realize it. So did you, did you actually present that to your editor to go look for the scene in, in like movie history with like pink donut boxes to put in this edit? We, we did because, you know, the more I, I researched and looked into this is, yeah, what is an American donut? Like if a Cambodian person makes an, Amer an American donut, is it an American donut or is it a Cambodian donut? Like, and what does it mean to be American? You know, and, I, and learning of Ted's story of how he got to the U.S. and built this donut empire, I was like, "Oh wow, what, what one man, what one refugee from Cambodia did when he landed here? It has permeated our entire culture in ways that we probably never think about. Like we don't even think about donuts because they're everywhere. We don't really think about where they come from. We don't think about the pink boxes. We know it. We recognize it." Like you said, as soon as you saw all of the pop culture references of pink boxes, you're like, yeah, of course, it's everywhere, all over TV and all over the movies. But no one ever thinks about why they're, why the boxes yeah. are pink. I mean, for, for me myself, you know, growing up in Long Beach, I've always thought that um, donuts was made, was just made by Cambodians. It was just, every donut shop was just Cambodian. I didn't think anything else, <laughs> you know, so. but that's just me. That's just, you know, that's just how I grew up, so. Yeah, and it's funny. You know, when we started doing this and we're, you know, we work in film and we talk to different people about the story. And what are you up to? Oh, we're up to this donut movie. They're like, oh, that's fascinating. And like the, the craft service people, oh, where I pick up my donuts, those are Asian people. But I thought it was just that shop that I went to. But now I think about it, they're like every donut shop we go to is Asian people. Yeah. You know, and it's and this kind of like light bulb going off, this aha moment. It's like, the yeah, they the are all Asian the film was supposed to premiere at South by Southwest, correct? Yes. And um, Lupu, Lupu, um, Doi, have you seen yes. the movie? No, Lupu, not yet. No, I don't. I don't. I don't know. What? What? I are are you has are you hesitant about watching yourself on screen, Boo? Um, are you yeah, excited? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I. Yes and yes and no. <laughs> because I'm excited uh, to see you, you know, myself in the because uh, in in a movie. But secondly, I little uh, feel like uh, who am I? Uh, how can I do the acting work? And you know, it just take almost two years with Alice all over the country here and in the US. Uh, of course, I want to see it, but. Uh, I feel a little bit shy to see myself <laughs> in the <a> screen. <laughs> what, was, what, what was the most difficult for you, uh, Lupu, to make this um, documentary? Because you have to get, you know, you have to talk to discuss with the filmmaker about your personal life yeah. and they have yes. to get deep into it. What was the most um, personal to you? Well, uh, most difficult is my language. You know, I'm not, uh, see, I learned English from, from mouth to mouth. But but I got the French foundation. I feel I I in the third year of the French university learning law school at law college. But the, for English section, I I very poorly speak English, you know. But when I was in America, I learned English through the mouth, through the selling donuts. <laughs> so so my English knowledge is not that that good like you, Brian and Kelly. You know you you talk and you no, went yeah. to. You went to the university. You all are graduate from, from you know very high 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 school. But then it, but the, the most important, the most easy for me is, is the language. So I and the story itself is okay because I I I can talk the story. I can tell the story without difficulty. But I have to prepare in the language for me is the most most difficult. <laughs> Your your English is great. I I learned you know I learned English through um, Sesame Streets and Doctor Zeus. So Dr. Seuss. reading Doctor Zeus is how I learned how to rap, how rhyme and learn how to rap. So <laughs> yeah yeah we make it, but uh, through very difficult with uh, uh, work with Alice, but but we make it at the end. 
Thank God for that. <laughs> How about you, Alice? What was the most difficult and challenging part about this production, making this documentary? Uh, you know, working with Ted was was great, and it was it was actually really wonderful how our, our relationship developed. Of course, when you first start filming and you just meet somebody, he's like, "Okay, tell me everything about your life." You know, it's a little it's a little more challenging, you know. But as our relationship we grew over two years of filming, like we're really good friends now, you know, and I feel like there's a big mutual yeah, trust with each other. And, you know, we're able to get really beautiful and intimate moments because, because of that trust. Um, what honestly was the most difficult uh, was I wanted to visually portray how vast the Cambodian donut empire is, you know, and to do that, I really needed like cuts in quick succession of, of, Cam of portrait of portraits of Cambodian donut shop owners, you know, that they look pretty modest and simple. And, you know, just knowing Asian culture and people, it was like, okay, how am I, how am I gonna get these people with a cold call to agree to let me come in with a big camera and film them and sign a release? And I remember one day I had the camera, I mapped out 30 different donut shops that I was gonna hit throughout the entire day. And I was like, hey, I'm good. I'm, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna spend some money, talk to them, let them know what I'm up to, and then ask them if I can, you know, just film them for about five minutes or less. My list of 30, I got 29 no's. Oh, wow. And That's and it was so demoralizing. <laughs> and I just knew that I had to have that in the film. And I was like, how are we going to get this? And you keep trying again and it's no, 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 no. And finally, you know, Ted came to the States and I said, I, I, know, who's, I know who's gonna get these people to say yes. And I said, Ted, you have to help me. And oh, yeah. I had a list for him to go through all the donations. That's what you got all the yes. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what about that though. It, it's very true. I mean, the, the Cambodian community is, is very open, um, but you just kind of, I, I think it's the language barrier sometimes. So it's the ask. Um, CTFF usually does this bike ride to put posters up in these like Cambodian shops like every year. And my husband is terrible at Khmer. So every time he goes into a shop and he asks like an owner to put up the poster, they'd be like, no. And then we'll send in Rithi, who is like completely fluent and, you know, and is able to interact in a way where they, they're like, oh, you know, like we're comfortable. Um, they're like, okay, go ahead. And my and, husband's and like, they no. And they give him food too. And, and they, they give him food. <laughs> so an offering. Yeah, we completely understand that. That that is why, like, I try to learn as much Khmer as possible over the years since I've been in Long Beach. Um, but we have a question um, from the audience. Switching over, um, Ted, what do you think? What did you think when Alice approached you about the film, about filming? Well, uh, first of all, I say, who who are interested to hear my story? You know, I'm just a ordinary people. And in fact, uh, I learned a lot of things in, in, a lot of things from my mother. She's from China. She's a humble and she's a very high morality woman. And she taught me all the, the noble thing. And so, uh, I, of course I'm excited, but, uh, but I, I just talk, just think for a minute for myself. For doing donut shop is uh, and for helping people, these only these are only natural thing that I learn and I would like to do to help people. But to put me on the movie, I I really I don't think I I don't think people want to <laughs> to read or to hear my story. But uh, finally, I don't know. She convinced me. She said, "You should." I say, "Well, of course, I'm not looking for the money, but if you can do it." And some people want to watch it. People want to see it. Do it, you know. But uh, but it's quite honor. And finally, she made it, and I'm so happy at the end. 
Yeah. And and Alice, um, I, I noticed that um Wrigley Scott, the legendary director, filmmaker, which is one of my favorite filmmakers of all time. You got Wrigley Scott to be an executive producer. How does that come about on the film? And the second question is, would Scott Free Production be interested in developing this into a feature film? Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> so Ridley is also a god. I mean, he's legendary. And, and we're so fortunate to have his name attached to the Donut King. Um, my producer, Jose, and I, we both, when we're not doing documentaries, we come from the world of commercials. And Wrigley Jose, came from commercial. What's that? Uh, Wrigley came from commercial as well. Came from commercials and Jose works a lot at, at RSA, which is Ridley's production company. And we just, as we're filming, we were like, wouldn't it be so sick if, if we got Scott Free really like into this? So I'm gonna try and make that happen. And, and I was like, that would be so sick, right? And then through like another connection with Scott Free, we kind of were able to double end it. And what's really incredible is that they had closed their documentary department. It's not really something that they do anymore. And we're like, okay, well, you know, no expectations, but this is what the film's about. And here's a link to a teaser. And they saw it and they're like, we'd be stupid not to jump on this. Like, this is incredible. This is such a great story. And Ridley, apparently he, he said that it reminded him of himself when he and his brother had moved here from England. Yeah. They didn't know anybody. It was the same, it was an immigrant story of them trying to make a name for themselves and a name they made for themselves, you know, but they were trying to make a name for themselves and working their way on up in a new land. And so he completely identified with it. And I mean, the, I can't tell you the day he was like, yeah, put my name on it. it was pretty surreal. Um, and Have you seen the movie? what's that? Have he seen the movie? Uh, I, I'm not sure if he's seen the finished film. Um, he's a pretty busy man. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we his, have a, his, oh, brother, his brother, his brother. The day that I got the call. That yeah, his brother Tony has, uh, Tony Scott has a connection with Long Beach, but a very tragic one, so. Uh, yes. Yeah, well, that, but that's a different story for a different time. Yeah. Um, but yes, Scott Free is, uh, is attached to the Donut King uh, to develop into a, a scripted version. Oh, you hear it, fir you hear it here first, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Scoop. Um, so we have a question from the, an audience member, Stephen Lang. Question for Ted. Do you feel that younger generations of Cambodian Americans today are taking over their parents' shops when they enter retirement? What's the future of the donut biz? That's interesting because I have seen the documentary, but I'll let Ted answer it. <laughs> well, uh, of course, young generation, they look up to do better, better job, easier, and get higher, get high pay. It's different from the old generation. The old generation, like myself, like the, the, the other folk, they came to the country, they don't speak uh, English. But uh, because the donut uh, business operation are simple, uh, what you need to do is just go in and learn to pay, learn how to take care of the cell. And you can use a finger, use a, you know, use a gesture, and can, 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 uh, can start the donut trade. And, and I think the, the, but in fact, uh, in donut business, uh, the young generation should uh, have a different thinking. Uh, it's not the, uh, uh, see, the donut shop is like other business. Uh, the most important is the independent. You don't have to work for other people. You become self-employed and you have all the, all kind of freedom. And besides, you can make big money if you, you want to put a long hour and, you know, determine to, to make it success. Like uh, some of young, younger uh, uh, cousin or nephew of mine, they, 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 they change all the thing, be creative and they can make a, big, a lot, a lot more money than we expected. 
the the future of the donut business, I think it will, it will sustain. Why? Because just like other business, and donut is American f breakfast in the morning, and unless we don't need breakfast. But uh, to cope with the high rent, to cope with the higher ingredient, the cost, and everything else, we have to add some other item like a Chinese fast food, or like a hamburger, or like a you know, ice cream or sandwiches. I think the future is still there, you know, because Cambodian people are working hard and uh, they're not afraid to work hard. So it doesn't mean that other people they don't they, they you know they they they're not working hard. And besides, Cambodian already it also I think uh, why Cambodian donut business uh, will sustain will be uh, you know last longer and have more future because you see other other community can uh, afraid of coming to the donut business because when they go to every corner they see. Cambodian donut, Cambodian donut. <laughs> so like Vietnamese or like Laotian or Thai people, they 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 feel like this is a Cambodian market, this is a Cambodian got it. <laughs> business. Got it. Yeah. They, they, they they cannot steal away from from for our be of Cambodian business. <laughs> so I think it will sustain. <laughs> no Very problem. Cool. No. Um, <laughs> you're sorry, Lopu, you're there in Cambodia now. How how is the Cambodian uh, donut shop business in Cambodia? Yeah, the Cambodian donut business in Cambodia it doesn't look look uh, look 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 good. <laughs> Cambodian number one may be the cost is too high because the ingredient they have to ship from overseas and other things they have to you know, so the the production cost so expensive and just they have to sell expensive. So number one it may be expensive item, number two may be it's not type of a uh, sweetie for Cambodian people, you know. So they don't look they don't look too as successful here in Cambodia. Okay, um, so I'm gonna do a plug in because I think the documentary does this really well in answering the question of like what does the future of Cambodian donut shops look like. Um, so you guys are able to watch the documentary for this weekend starting tomorrow. So check back with LA Asian Pacific Film Festival website, their Facebook, and also Cambodia Town Film Festival Facebook for more information on that. But I just wanted to give a shout out to that. And also while we're there, shout out to DK Donuts, which is also featured in this documentary. Um, Alice, there's like hundreds of donut shop stories or donut shop owners, Cambodian. Why did you feature the DK Donut story and how did you come about meeting them and that particular story? Well, this is all a uh, happenstance, right? So after I read the articles and I really, you know, this was a story that I felt like I really needed to tell. I thought, okay, where do I, where do I begin? Gosh, and then I'm already thinking of what I mentioned earlier, the daunting task of cold calling and some Cambodian donut shop owner receiving a cold call. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, can we film you? And it's gonna just be no, no, no. And so that was, that was pretty daunting, but I, I called the first donut shop I could think of in Santa Monica, which is where I live, like the closest one to me, which is uh, DK's Donuts. And to my surprise, a girl with perfect English who sounds young picks up the phone. And, you know, I give her the whole cold call spiel and said, hey, my name is Alice. I'm a filmmaker in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, I know about this story, The Donut King. And, and I really want to make a documentary. I just, the whole cold call. And to my surprise and delight, um, she says, well, you've called the right person. I can help you. Ted is my great uncle. And are you on Facebook? I'll, I'll connect you guys. And that she did. And, you know, a day later, we were, we were chit chatting over Facebook and talking and that's how we connected. Um, and God, I was so like, I had no idea that there would actually be a relation. So of course we, we had to feature DKs. Oh, very cool. Um, did you know about the history of Cambodia? Be was your first visit to Cambodia, your first visit to Cambodia? And what was the most surprising thing you learned about the country and the culture? Hmm, it, it was, so I knew, 
kind of very superficial information, of course, about Pol Pot killing fields, genocide. You know, I, I knew about that, but I didn't know too much. You know, I didn't do too much of a deep dive into it. And what I knew about Cambodia, Angkor Wat, Tomb Raider, you know, that's kind of the, what it's known for. And when I first went to meet Ted and we're in Phnom Penh, it's a huge city. Mm -hmm. uh, but what surprised me is what I found out from our local field producer there. This is a shout out to Moot. Ah, oh, <laughs> Moot, love that guy. Yeah, love him. <laughs> this is a shout out to Moot. Um, is he said he'd been so he our field producer was he came as a kid like a baby basically to to philly and he'd moved back to cambodia god i might be getting my numbers wrong but i think at that time like seven it's either seven or 11 years and he said that 11 years ago when he went to cambodia there were two high rises in the entire city and he said in I think it might be seven years. He's like, in, in this span of time, now there's more than a hundred. Yeah. So it's the amount of growth. He's like, dude, these, these roads were dirt when I got here seven years ago. And now everything is paved and overpasses and freeways. And so I, I think I was a bit surprised <clears throat> to see how modernized and developed it was. And I think now, like when we see, when we, Think of donuts we always like recognize about the pink box look boo did you ever get it copyrighted or trademarked for the pink box <laughs> would you get like would you get a penny or a dime every time somebody uses the pink box i think <laughs> <that> would... <laughs> well uh i think it's 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 not a whole lot of saving but when you talk about big quantity by millions then you're talking about it's a huge huge saving from, from using a pin box instead of a white box. In fact, it's, an, it's no different, you know, it's just a box to hold the donut, <laughs> but because the, the pin box costs less money, penny it's, less. It's very, it's very symbolic and very iconic too, because like now, you, you know, from cartoons, from the Simpsons to like Seinfeld, to all these TV shows, they don't walk in the scene with a box, with a white box of donut. They always come in with a pink box of donut. <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. Filmmakers don't like white. <laughs> um, so you, you created something iconic so it's in, and very historic so thank you for that which, thank you. which transitions me to this um <laughs> like i love that you not only tell the history of cambodian immigrants um but you also deep dive into a little bit of like the history of donuts in general how cooperative was winchell's and duncan donuts in telling this story alice uh, you know, that was, I had to do a little, that was like a walking on a tightrope. You know, I had to be very delicate. Uh, but, you know, they were really, they were, God, they were both really super generous with their time about the growth of, of Duncan and Winchell's. I mean, they were the two big giant corporate donut chains yeah. at the time. Um, so, so both of those guys were super gracious, super generous. And, you know, they're passionate about donuts too. They're more than happy to talk about all the different flavors and, and donut nostalgia and, and what it means to have a bite into your first donut. I actually do remember looking for Dunkin' Donuts when I first moved to like Orange County, which is the strangest thing because I it never like dawned on me that like mom and pop sh shops and Cambodians just had the running with it. And I was just like, where's the Dunkin' Donuts? Cause you know, the coffee, that was a very East Coast Asian thing. Like we, like all we see is Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> um, we have a question from an audience for Ted. What's better, a yeast donut or a cake donut? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there's a two type of donut, of course. Cake donut is easier to make because uh, we don't use yeast. And the yeast donut is, well, it depends on uh, people like, you know, the bluffy and, uh, bluffy and, well, I like glazed donut, but many people like cake donut and buttermilk donut. 
but they did different have a different one if we go through years and one you just make it from you know from from for, for the mix but, that but just made me hungry. people like it yeah <laughs> <laughs> that just hungry. made me hungry i'm like where's my donuts <laughs> and, and yeah. while we're while we're talking about that i i just want to say that um you know, Lupu, thank you for all you have done. Like the whoever is tuning into this right now, you don't understand the impact as uh, Ted or Mr. Nguyen has has, uh, has done. I mean, no. he has sponsored hundreds of people, hundreds of refugees from Cambodia, and when they got to America, uh, he literally gave them an opportunity to start their own business and, and start living their own dreams. So, thank you, thank you for doing that. And you are a Renaissance and a pioneer in your own rights to help develop. Um, Long Beach and, and the Cambodia town community. Thank you for that too. So thank, Brian, thank I tell you. What, Brian, I want to say this. This is my honor and my pleasure, my uh, my uh, my privilege to to serve my community, to serve my people when the time they need it, and not just for our people, for all people in the world. I always with my open heart, with my my love to serve them and to help them. Thank you. Yeah. It's, thank, it's, thank, it's, thank you for doing that. I mean, especially such, now. Such honor, such honor, yes. But ex especially now in the time that we're living in this troubled time, are you guys okay? I mean, um, in, throughout your community there in, in Cambodia, I heard there's no cases, no one died from it. Um, it's a different story here in the States. Uh, it's, it gets a little complicated, but I just want to make sure that everybody's okay um, yeah. with the, with the COVID-19 there in Cambodia. Yeah, Cambodia is so blessed, so blessed. And yeah. Really, uh, so we thank God for for blessing Cambodia. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I, I also want to I I also want to plug this in too because um before this whole COVID nineteen happened, like in uh, in February, I was in a meeting and a discussion with the Cambodia Town Inc. where they were the one that's putting together the Cambodian New Year parade, and um, uh, Lupu, uh, Ted was uh, was what was supposed to come and do his book signing. He has a new book out. Um, but Boo, do you have that book with you? Can you show that real quick? Uh, yeah, yeah. There yeah. you go. So give, if, where can we find that book and where can they buy it at? Oh, there's an English version too. There's the English, yeah. that's the Cambodian yeah. version. There's the English, English version. version. <laughs> this English version. And the Cambodian book you can buy from, from Cambodia. Or right now, Richard and Shatir have about 150 books. Okay. I donate to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the Cambodian town. And I'm going to ship another 150. I'm shipping... 300 books together to help, uh, you know, the community. They can sell for $15 per book in Cambodian community and they can use money to do the, to help the expenses. This is my donation to the Cambodian town, yes. Yeah, thank you. So, who you know, again, please pick up the book um, uh, <laughs> if, if you want to know more about that. I, I He has done a lot for our community for um, to, to, to build this and to actually see this movie. I can't wait or I'm pretty sure Alice can't wait to show you guys tomorrow. Make sure you tune in tomorrow to watch that. Um, Kaylee, you want to ask another question? Yeah, moving to the to the book, Alice, um, did you get a hold of the manuscript for the book before it was published? And did it help you in making this film, this documentary? Uh, I got an early copy of the book and that book was our Bible, basically. I mean, it, it provided so much research and backstory that it was a springboard that we could go there and do deeper dives from that. So the book was, got it. Yeah, it, it was tremendously helpful. Um, I also want to say one more thing as um, just uh, a child of refugees. Um, it was very nice to see in this documentary that you not only portrayed like the killing fields, but you also showed a lot about the struggles and the anxieties and the fears of the refugees who landed in Camp Pendleton. And you showed a lot of footage of that and of people talking about like how they felt when they first arrived in this new country. Cause to me, I'd had, had always wondered like what people were going through through that time. And I, I could never imagine it. Um, so I think I just wanted to say, I'm grateful for, that you did that, that you told and manage to kind of document a piece of our history, not just as Cambodians, but Cambodian Americans here um, in California. And I will transition to a, a question on top of that. Did you decide that um, in pre-production of the documentary or was it something that you discovered 
as you were making the film that, you know, you should maybe talk more about what people were feeling. What were the sponsorship like? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, that was something I determined pretty early on in pre-production, you know, and that, again, that was, the book was very helpful. You know, Ted named his sponsor in the book and, you know, how he felt, you know, you're so grateful to get out of the camp. You can't get out of the camp unless you have a sponsor. So that's the, the kindness of people. Um, but yeah, that was very important to me to relay because there are, I think for a casual observer, there is like one perception of refugees, right? Like that we think now is refugees are the, the, car the caravan the, that's coming through Central America, or we hear a lot about lifeboats, you know, the refugees in Europe who are fleeing by sea and, and all you see is, is these, these people who it's like, oh, okay. And that kind of paints only like a single faceted perspective on, on refugees, but it doesn't really humanize them. It kind of groups them as a whole, right? It's like all these people who are on a boat or all these people who are on a border who, who need help or are in camps. But I really wanted to, to humanize refugee and challenge people what, what their preconceived notion of a refugee is, you know, and, and their people, you know, these are people who arrive in the middle of the night from somewhere that's tropical and warm and to land in the middle of the night in the desert in California and what that feels like, you know, how many people can say that they've had that experience to leave with, with, you know, you have like no belongings and go to a country that you don't speak the language and just get dropped there and have to make a new life, you know? And that's something that I've had the privilege that, God, I was just born here and went to school. Everything's super easy. And it's to show the resilience of refugees and what they go through. And, and you know, when they're sponsored, what they can provide for a community if just given a chance. Yeah. And Camp, Camp Pendleton here is here in um, California. And also back then, like the, the port of Long Beach was like a naval base. And before the killing field happened, you have a lot of uh, foreign exchange students from Cambodia coming to Cal, uh, Cal State Long Beach. And that's where kind of um, the Cambodian community in Long Beach started building up. So you had the student exchange from, um, from Cambodia and then the war happened and they, and they end up staying here. And also you have the refugees coming from Camp Pendleton as well. And also other refugees coming outside to the port. And then, you know, as, as refugees, you tend to say, hey, where, do you know any relatives or nearby where they live? And then we try to mobilize and get closer to each other. So that's, that's how the community started building here in Long Beach. Uh, I have an audience question uh, for Alice. What was your process for transitioning from DP to director for this debut? Hmm. Well, um, you know, uh, this was, we had to approach this a little bit differently, you know? So I came up as a DP and then I've been working in commercials as a director DP. Um, but this was, this was a new task, right? This is having to really tell a story and weave in archival, weave in history. There's so many, God, I mean, the story is so rich. There's so many facets of it to tell. Um, so I would say what I had working for me, again, is you said in the very beginning of, of this video, Kaylee, is that I've had the privilege to work with, I feel like such masters of the craft, you know, Rory Kennedy and Werner Herzog, Stacey Peralta, to name a few, and being able to observe their process um, and studying a lot of, you know, of documentaries and what the ones that resonate with me and what I think makes for good storytelling. So I, I would say that I had, um, you know, I don't know about an easier transition, but a transition that just seemed quite natural to me given who I'd been able to train under. Thank you. And, and speaking of storytelling, there is, I, I don't want to give much away, um, but there is a love story in, in, in this, this film. Um, and there's, I, I have to ask this question, uh, Lepu, there's, there's a scene there, I'm not sure if I heard it right or wrong, but there's a scene there that you went to stay with uh, Christy, and then, uh, can I say, like, he kind of hid under the bed, 
and then he stayed there for like four to five days. Is it four to five days or four t five days? Forty five days. Forty five wow, days. Wow! How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because, because the first love. This is my first love, and I love it dearly. Food? Like she just brought you food to the. the... <laughs> yeah, exactly. That that wow. that's a real maid, and uh, she ordered her to to sneak from the from from the sideway and get, always provide me food with other things. Uh -huh. So forty five days is a long day and night. But because yep. of the love, because of uh, <laughs> you know, her her beauty, <laughs> I can I will stay That's very even bold. die even die for her. <laughs> yeah, was it was there a restroom in the um the bathroom in the bedroom? How how do you did you sneak out of the room? How did that work? I mean no. 45 <laughs> days is like a month and a half. That's crazy. I know. But the bathroom is next to the next Pratch to her not, room. Pratch is not the first one to think that that was a misprint. And because I got asked the same question, is it four to five days or 45 days? And I was just like, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's 45 days, guys. Yeah. 45 days. But I mean, our 45... <laughs> our like 45 we're 14. Days, yeah. yeah. yeah we're 45. 14 and, you know, we're almost killing each other past like 10 days. So you made it yeah. past 45 days. So yeah, congratulations. But Brad, I, I thank you for, for, for brought this uh, sub subject up. You know, we're talking about uh, Romeo and Julio. Romeo, what? Romeo and Julio, the love story? Juliet, yeah, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, yeah, that's right, the Juliet. I think uh, my love story is, uh, is, 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 you know, it's a true story. Stay under her bed for 45 days, and when the parents discover, and I, I escape, and then uh, I commit suicide, and she commits suicide. So, so I think Threaten. that should be... Should, <laughs> should be put on, a, on another movie, another movie, and it's a real story. It's a, it's a real story, a real person, and I think someone should make a movie. Kelly, maybe you can make a movie of a love story, a modern love story. No, no, no. that is that is like a horror film for me. <laughs> <laughs> Say for forty five days. Uh, no, I but, have, <laughs> while we're on the subject of like this particular section. Um, the animated section was done really well, Alice, and I, I really enjoyed what that brought to like the story and, and making it so visceral and just us placing us there. Um, I was just wondering, um, it, the, the animation reminds me of paintings by Andrew Hem, and, and I was thinking, was that intentional? Do you even know who Andrew Hem is? Because every time I saw the animation, I was like, my God, that looks like an Andrew Hem painting. Andrew Hem was our artist. So very good eye, Kaylee. <laughs> okay, that makes a lot of sense now. Um, it, and I didn't know Andrew personally, um, but it was very important for me to find a Cambodian artist. You know, there are, for obvious reasons, there are parts of the film that there's just no archival, uh, or there's, you know, it's not like when he was under the bed that he was there with a Super 8 camera documenting it, you know, <laughs> that was, so we're like, how are we going to tell this amazing part of this story and it was kind of slid into his dms and i dm'd him on instagram and and hit him up and told him about what i was looking for and he wrote back and he said i'm familiar with with ted noy uh, i think my parents knew him i was a donut kid too <laughs> so I mean, that was just, it, it had come around full circle and just as a bit of context again for how resilient refugees and second generation refugees are. You know, Andrew Hem is this incredible, incredible artist and he went to Art Center and has had solo exhibits the world over. And I'm like, look, the kid of immigrants went to one of the best art schools in the entire world and makes a living as an artist. I mean, that's, I think that's just kind of speaks for itself in the American dream. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm just very glad you did that. And, you know, I can't tell you enough how much I, I love this documentary and, and I just love um, the bridge between the old generation and the new generation and how we can meet together. Um, yeah. Pratch? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, when I was younger, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Um, 
I remember like waking up in early in the morning on like a Saturday afternoon and we have these, this Cambodian commercial and it comes on and goes, and then they'll tell you what kind of <laughs> listing, what kind of <laughs> listing that they have and stuff, you know? And I remember like going to the, some of the stores, like at the donut shop, they would have these commercials and they would try to do plugins with donut shop as well. So it's, it's interesting how like the community works. And, you know, I, when I wa watching the documentaries, it brings, it brings a lot of um, memories back. And especially when uh, Boothead, you know, talking about when he just first came as refugees, um, not all refugees came after the war, like some for uh, Boothead himself, you know, he came before the war in 75. And, but then when he came, you know, he established something and kind of sets a uh, foundation up for the next wave of refugees that come and to create jobs and, and such like that. So without, you know, without giving too much away, I, I can go on and on talking about this film, but I, I thank you, Alice, for making the film and congratulations again on your film. I wish we could have shown this uh, to the public, you know, in like a big packed theater. I'm pretty sure we can provide that later on in the future, but due to the circumstances, I, I think that start, starting tomorrow, people can watch it um, online and take it for themselves and, you know, it, it's it's a it's a great honor to um, to be talk having conversation with uh, Le Boutet as well. Thank and, you, thank you. And I again, I can go on and on talking about you, but then I will be ruining the documentary. <laughs> so. Yeah, we were we we're very specific about not doing any spoilers because I realized that like a lot of audience that are joining us today probably hasn't seen um, the documentary, and I, I really do urge everyone out there if you're watching to go check it out this weekend. Um, and hopefully we, you know, like, like Pratt say, we can bring it to you on the bigger screen. And I, I think it, it'll be great for even the Cambodian community, refugee com communities to watch a documentary like this. Um, that, yep, yeah, that's, that's all I have. There's a question from the, uh, um, from the oh, viewer, from I Laura. Guess. She says, what's, what's something that people can learn about the Cambodian culture through this documentary? Well, Gosh. Uh, I'll, I'll let Alice and um. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. What? Uh, God, there's a lot that can be gleaned from this. Uh, I think. Wow. Most importantly, what can be learned about the Cambodian culture through this documentary is that uh, Cambodian people are not afraid of hard work. Uh, and and being not being afraid of hard work is the only way that you can successfully build a donut shop and create a living in for yourself in America. I mean, donuts in 1975, there are 10 cents each. And for Ted to become a millionaire, I mean, when I first met him, I was like, how do you become a millionaire 10 cents at a time? <laughs> like that's, that's crazy. Or how, and, and donut shops, I mean, a lot of them typically are open 24 hours a day. And God, they don't have like nannies and childcare. Like, what do you do with the kids? And when are you going to sleep? And to save money, you're not hiring employees. Um, so I think that a big takeaway from this film is the resilience of the Cambodian people and their willingness to work hard. Correct. And what's your favorite Cambodian food, by the way? Me? Yes. Fish amok. <laughs> for days <laughs> yes fish and milk is really good how about you Lupu what's your favorite Cambodian dish donuts uh, <laughs> Cambodian dish salam salam with you and donut <laughs> um, there's another question Lupu um, what advice do you have for the younger generation who wants to bridge the generation gap between their parents um and since there's a lot of language barrier and such like that, how, how do you come about talking to your, um, the, the younger generation with the older generation? Well, uh, we, we've been talking previously, you know, don't look at donut shop as a, as, you know, as a small business. Of course, like myself, in the 85, I have about 70 donut shop. I start with nothing, you know, with penniless. So, so donut shop is, is a, Look, consider donut shop as a one of the of the, of the business, a trade, a trading business, and uh, 
And uh, of course, young generation, they have their own agenda and they can look for other, other career, bigger pay or, or easier work. But, uh, but then uh, the donut business, uh, I think, yeah, of course, they have, they have, they have their choice. They have the preferences. They can stay with uh, donut business, heritage from their parents, or they can go to other fields. But uh, business is a business, you know, when you want to make money, just, uh, you know, just figure out how to put up a strategy, put up a plan and, and go from there, you know, even donut business, there's still a lot of room to, to grow the donut business, you know, like some other younger generation, they add some Chinese food, they add some ice cream, some sandwiches, they, they make a pretty good money. And, 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 and I just, just to answer to Kelly's uh, previous question, uh, is, there, is the donut business still have the future? I think yes. But uh, I suggest our donut business owner, like all Cambodians who own donut shop, should form an association, donut shop association, so to, make, to, to strengthen yourself and to, pro, uh, to you know, to, just, just to, to protect, to, pro, to protect each other. I think that donor business association should help in, in the long run. And for the Cambodian young generation, please you know, uh, have a book, a Donut King book, just to read something, you know, a good part and something bad part like gambling stuff, <laughs> just stay away. And just, just, just to have a self-confident, don't, don't count on the destiny, just count on yourself, self-confident and build up a successful life. And the, yeah, for the young generation, you know, I think, I think they have a good chance because they live in America, they live in the third country, even they live in Cambodia today. Cambodian young generation love to, to learn English, love to learn Chinese. I think all Cambodian young generation will have better future, we have a very good, good day than, than our old generation. Good luck. <laughs> uh, watch the Donut King with your parents. <laughs> the, um, also, yes. this, uh, there's a uh, question from an audience. Uh, how many donuts did you guys eat during the making of Donut King? Uh, <laughs> God, uh, you know, I I showed pretty good restraint throughout because God, you know, every shop we went to, we got offered donuts, we had to eat them, uh, which were delicious. But I remember one time at Maylie's shop. Uh, she, they were doing buttermilk bars and we were filming. I have to say this, a lot of the footage is very mouthwatering. <laughs> so we were filming the, the buttermilk bars being made and she offered me one and I said, no, thank you. You know, I was just like, Ugh, you know, I, I don't think I can, uh, I was going to be good. And she said, well, I can, I can cut it up so you guys can split it, I can cut it into quarters so you guys can, and I was like, oh, okay, I'll do that. I'll have like a, a quarter. I had never had a donut fresh within 30 seconds of being out of the fryer. So I can tell you that this buttermilk bar from DK's <laughs> fresh out of the fryer was an out of body experience. Like it was insane. I had my quarter and then I hoarded the rest. I was like, I can't. <laughs> so I will never forget that moment. It was out of body. Yeah, what DK Donuts has been doing evolving kind of like the donut, the Cambodian donut in industry has been very impressive. I know I follow them on Instagram and their donuts just always look like you want to drive to Santa Monica and pick one up and just like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still dream about them. Yeah. So um, that's all we have time for today. Thank you guys in the audience for joining us. And thank you, Alice, for being here and for having your film as being part of the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival. Everybody just remember, you can view the Donut King tomorrow. The window opens tomorrow through Sunday. Um, thank you, um, Lupu, for Ted, for joining us. And, and also, it was very nice to see you again. Thank you so much. I'm an honor to be on your show. Thank you so much. Thank oh. you so much, everybody. Bye. Also, Thank for you. more information, please check out Visual Communications at www.dcmedia.org. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good good night. Night. Thank, Thank you, Brian. You. Thank you, Kaylee. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Thank you.
Chocolate donut. Cocaine on the track, beer. Chocolate donut, maple syrup, glazing donut, Dunkin' donut, Dunkin' donut, bars of donut, sprinkle donut, football donut, hazel donut, candy donut, Texas donut, Philly donut, jelly donut, crispy donut, powder donut. Chocolate donut, maple syrup, gotta go and get that rib Rolling blunts and smoking purple, got the gas to make you work cough cough until you see in circles Hershey dipping, we be setting, caramel saving, we be sipping Sugar rushing, we be running I was tripping for a minute, I thought I was losing interest Dunkin' Donuts on my hit list, running up that juicy feeling Pastry hunting, thirsty bitches, tell me what's up on that mission Gotta get up, go and get it, that's a hybrid definition Get the donut, that's the difference, passing all my previous visions Chocolate donut with the feeling, yeah, I know it sounds delicious. If you want it, you can get it. Call me up, I got you, baby. Chocolate donut, maple syrup, glazing donuts, pumpkin donuts, Dunkin' Donuts, bars of donuts, sprinkle donuts, football donuts, hazel donut, candy donut, Texas donut, Philly donut, jelly donut, crispy donut, powder donut. Got the munchies in vape buffets looking for.